Hello everyone and welcome to another Foul Original. This video was made in part thanks to the Foul Original people over on patreon.com slash Foul Original. Patreons get early access to all my videos ad-free before they go public on YouTube. More details will be at the end of the video. This week we roll past another stop sign on our look into the faction that helped reignite interest in Impact Wrestling back between 2012 and 2014. Almost six months into the storyline, we were already seeing the Aces and Eights grow in numbers and become more brazen in their attacks. Their tactics put face and heel at risk with their true intentions as masked as the members in their ranks. Doc had just been patched in and became a full member of the group. Their next goal was gold and the Sergeant at Arms would be at hand to realise that goal. This is part three of the story of the Aces and Eights. The revolution will be televised. Since July 2012, the Aces and Eights had interfered in matches with no real pattern to their path of destruction. This approach would change when the group looked to capture their first championship. To execute this plan, they would need to dethrone the current TNA television champion, Samoa Joe. On the December 6th episode of Impact Wrestling, the Sergeant at Arms Devon would challenge TNA TV champion Samoa Joe to a match. With some outside interference and assistance from the newly patched in member Doc, Devon would win this match. With this win, the group now held one of TNA's prized possessions. The Aces and Eights now held TNA Gold. As a quick aside, Devon previously held the TV title earlier in 2012 during a feud with Robbie E. Devon was stripped of the title on September 26, 2012 by Hulk Hogan after holding it for 192 days. This was curiously before he had officially been unmasked as a member of the Aces and Eights at Bound for Glory 2012 on October 14, 2012. Up until this point, unlike his storyline brother Bully Ray, Devon had found most of his success as a tag team wrestler. After a long storied career as a tag team, they would be broken up during the first WWE brand split in 2002. Bully Ray going to Raw and Devon going to SmackDown. With his move to SmackDown in 2002, Devon would change his name to Reverend Devon and first claimed to be Mr. McMahon's spiritual advisor, until being teamed up with an up-and-coming wrestler from Florida Championship Wrestling. An animal who would become much more familiar in later years, but now was simply known as Deacon Batista. The Reverend Devon character drew upon some of Devon's real-life experiences in childhood. Growing up, his mother was a church pastor and his father was a bishop. Fast forward back to 2012, and on December 6, 2012, the Aces and Eights had backed up their threats. Devon was the TNA television champion, and there's nothing TNA could do about it. The Aces and Eights were an invading force in 2012, but weren't averse to making a little money on the side. During the December 6, 2012 episode of Impact Wrestling, the Sergeant at Arms Devon celebrated his championship win backstage over Samoa Joe with some beers and babes. As the beer flowed, he reassured the newly unmasked Doc that he would get his revenge on Kurt Angle later. The new TV champion would then get up to throw the dart for the evening's attack. He would be stopped in his tracks by the Vice President. The VP lets the rest of the gang know that he has closed a business deal and has a hit already lined up so there's no need for the dart. He says that money talks and bullshit walks, and that tonight they were going to do a hell of a lot of talking. The rest of the Aces and Eights continue to celebrate as the VP takes some money from a large envelope full of cash and puts it down the cleavage of the coke girl of the clubhouse. Meanwhile, Wes Briscoe, Garrett Bischoff and Kurt Angle are talking in the locker room backstage. Wes Briscoe had just won a TNA gut check the week before, which gave him a real-life contract with TNA. We'll look at what the TNA gut check was in a future video. Kurt tells him Wes's uncle would be proud and that it was quite a moment last week. 
Wes thanks Kirk for all his training and he'll be there for him whenever he needs. Kirk thanks him and lets Garrett know how proud he is of him too. Garrett thanks Kirk too and says he'll be ready to back him up. Kurt asks them to be ready to help during his match with Doc. He reminds them that the Aces and Eights took out Sting. He doesn't know why they are targeting him, but they messed with the wrong guy. Garrett and Wes tell him they'll back him up if he needs it, as Kurt walks out the locker room, getting ready for his match. Later that evening, Doc would meet Kurt Angle in a one-on-one matchup. The match would end after Kurt gets an ankle lock on Doc, looking to have the match won, but falls victim to a sneak attack from the Aces and Eights. This causes the referee to throw out the match as a DQ victory for Angle, due to the outside interference from the biker gang. Like a pack of dogs, the Aces and Eights surround Kurt in the middle of the ring looking to pounce. With that, Wes Briscoe and Garrett Bischoff start running down the entrance ramp, with a furious Samoa Joe making a path between them chasing the outlaw stable over the guardrail as they all hit the ring. Kurt grabs a mic to talk about the upcoming final resolution pay-per-view. He says that it will be him, Wes Briscoe, Garrett Bischoff, Samoa Joe, and any four members of the Aces and Eights choosing in a four-on-four matchup. The Aces and Eights seem to accept this challenge, with one shouting you're dead at the four men in the ring as we fade out. The night's main event would see Bobby Roode, Christopher Daniels, and Frankie Kazarian face AJ Styles, James Storm and Jeff Hardy in a six-man tag match. The match would end as AJ and Storm argue over who should be in the ring. As they continue their war of words in the corner, Hardy would tag himself in and cut off a sneak attack from Kazarian on his two tag team mates. With both men just looking on, still arguing, Frankie Kazarian would get a twist of fate for his troubles from the TNA World Heavyweight Champion Jeff Hardy. After the quick pin, Hardy's teammates would leave the ring unhappy with Jeff. He tries to apologise, but they are already making their way down the ramp backstage. Jeff holds up both his TNA World Heavyweight Championship and his own immortal belt to pose in the centre of the ring victorious, with his hand raised by referee Earl Hebner. However, he has no time to celebrate, as almost immediately the ring is full of the aces and eights who go straight after Jeff Hardy and start to beat him down. They strip off his shirt, Devon gives him some body shots, and the other members start to take it in turns, handing out some more punishment. They have him on the ground, until they are interrupted by James Storm coming down to the ring from backstage, swinging a steel chair to make the save for Hardy. The aces and eights scatter out of the ring and back over the guardrail, with smiles on their faces. The same smile on the face of Bobby Roode, who stands at the top of the entrance ramp. The Aces and Eights all give the thumbs up sign and Bobby starts to give them a round of applause. He then gives them a thumbs up right back. With this display, commentary started to put it all together and let us know what happened. The envelope of money earlier on that evening was a payoff from Bobby Roode. This attack on Jeff Hardy had been funded by him to soften up his challenger for that Sunday's final resolution TNA heavyweight championship match. His investment had paid off, as he shouted, it pays to be rude into the camera to close out that night's impact. Bobby Rude is now of course known to most fans as Robert Rude for his time in NXT and WWE. He was also a major part of the foundation of the early days of TNA and a big fan favourite whether face or heel. His character was that of a successful businessman, similar to the million dollar man Ted DiBiase and with more than a passing resemblance to 80s heartthrob and bad guy, Rick Rude. The Aces and Eights weren't just a faction looking to beat people up for free like Kurt Angle, they were happy to make some money on the side too. Like the APA and Chronic before them, their door was always open for the right offer. Of course, this was another nod to some of the ways in which some outlaw motorcycle clubs operate in real life. It's also a running theme in what we could refer to as a source material, for a lot of the Aces and Eights storyline, the FX TV show, Sons of Anarchy. At the final resolution pay-per-view on Sunday, December 9th, 2012, the Aces and Eights would be an eight-man tag team action. Devon, 
Dark and two members of the Aces and Eights would face off against the team of TNA wrestlers Kurt Angle, Samoa Joe, Garrett Bischoff and Wes Briscoe. The match would see the two teams go through a physical battle. The TNA wrestlers were here to make a statement and they did. At the conclusion, Angle would pick up the win for his team, pinning one of the masked members of the motorcycle group. In the main event of the pay-per-view, we would see TNA World Heavyweight Champion Jeff Hardy face off against Bobby Roode. Hardy was still feeling the effects of his attack on Impact a few days prior by the Aces and Eights, bankrolled by Roode. This didn't stop the charismatic Enigma from putting up a good fight. The match would almost end on a DQ when the Aces and Eights turned up in the crowd. Rude tries to distract the ref, thinking that the gang would attack Hardy behind the ref's back. The group just stand behind the guardrail as Rude shouted at them to get in and help. With this distraction, Hardy would be able to hit Rude with the twist of fate and retain his TNA World Heavyweight Championship. But before he would even have a chance to celebrate, the biker gang would rush the ring from the crowd and start to beat down Jeff Hardy. They leave him laying motionless in the ring. Rude gets up and is furious about this. He starts to shout at the aces and eights, poking them in the chest with his finger as he screams, blaming them for his loss. They've had enough of this and turn their attention to Rude. They beat him down in the same way they did to Jeff just moments ago. After leaving him laying in the ring, beaten next to Hardy, the Aces and Eights stand tall over Rude and raise their arms in victory as the pay-per-view closes. Rude has just learnt that the most valuable currency you can give to the Aces and Eights is respect, and today it didn't pay to be rude. December 27, 2012 was the final impact of the year and the Aces and Eights had teased adding some arrogant but smart muscle to help in their war against TNA. The gang would have a surprise for us all, as they extended an offer of membership to one of the many TNA wrestlers who hadn't really picked a side up until now, Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson, of course, was known to many for his time as the loud-mouthed and brash Mr. Kennedy in the WWE between 2005 to 2009. He was known for his unique and over-the-top entrance where he summoned a microphone from the ceiling on a cable so he could act as his own personal ring announcer before and after the match. He would even win the Money in the Bank briefcase during his time there at WrestleMania 23 in 2007. His catchphrase and practice of repeating his last name at the end of his promos to give it a little reverb, caught mainstream attention in the National Hockey League and a player called Tyler Kennedy. Mr. Kennedy Kennedy would then become Mr. Anderson Anderson after his release from the WWE in 2009. The release was mired in controversy with Anderson joining TNA in 2010, initially on a short-term one-year contract, but that's a story for another time. Mr. Anderson was a tweener for most of his TNA career, not really being either a face or heel for too long. Mr. Anderson wouldn't give an answer to anyone on this evening, as we were left on a cliffhanger for now. Would the self-proclaimed asshole join the outlaw gang, or would he take up the fight against them alongside the TNA roster in 2013? But that's all we have for this time. Quick question. Do you think the Aces and Eights should have accepted a payoff, or doesn't it matter? Join us next time for the Aces and Eights Part 4. That's got a sting, Mr. Anderson. This video was first available to all my Patreons, 24 hours before it went live on YouTube ad-free. A special thank you to all my current Patreons, their names will be on the screen right now. If you would like to support this video and future series, then please go to patreon.com slash fouloriginal and become a fop. Tiers start from $1 and they go towards getting more of these out to you. Like the video if you did, subscribe if you would, hit the bell notification if you please, and share this video if you can. This has been a foul original. Thanks for watching. See you next time.